All right, so our first student presenter is Weston Jordan. Uh, Weston Jordan is a candidate for Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and Mathematics. Uh, he came to the UNC as a residential scholar, scholar, one of the highest scholarships available. Weston has distinguished himself in the last four years with his aptitude in the academics. His more value skills in special subjects, such as mathematics, and his dedication to service. As part of his service, Weston has spent the last year as treasury of the SGA and chaplain for the physics and engineering club. Weston Jordan has also been accepted at the uh, Nazarene Theological Seminary, and so it's a pleasure to welcome Weston Jordan to the The title of his presentation is On the Complexity of Inverse Problems. All right. Woo. Okay, good afternoon everyone. So yes, my name is Weston Jordan. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my uh, senior research uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about um, inverse problems and the levels of depth and complexity that they entail along with uh, the best methodology to go about um, solving them. So uh, we want to talk about efficiency first. Um, there are two main uh, gauges we're going to use uh, to sort of summarize that. First of all, how accurate um, are, is, is the method that we're using? Obviously that's somewhat important. You don't want a huge margin of error or anything like that. The second is uh, the time it takes. So specifically real time. So um, are we waiting a couple hours for a solution? Are we waiting even upwards of a day? Or are we doing it much faster? Um, minutes or, or even seconds? Um, those are the two parameters that we really want to talk about here. Um, you might be thinking, okay, um, I've taken the inverse of a matrix before. It's uh, easy. I learned it my freshman year of high school or sophomore year of high school. Um, using the determinant, that sort of thing, well, that won't work here. Um, the matrices that we're using are with vast amounts of data, um, thousands and thousands of rows by thousands and thousands of columns. And to solve, to solve one of those using a determinant method is not something I would wish on anyone. It would take absolutely forever. So the hope is to uh, examine a variety of inverse methods and sort of, uh, this is in support of Dr. Cornelly's work. So if, uh, if you haven't had the chance to really hear any, anything about that, first of all, I'm sorry. I'll try and summarize it real quick for you. Um, but it's actually really cool stuff. So if we look right here at uh, our, our diagram, this is the Earth's uh, crust. Um, we're looking at uh, tectonic movements right here. There's uh, convergent boundaries and divergent boundaries and transform, transform boundaries. Um, way up here, uh, way off the screen, is uh, the atmosphere. And specifically, uh, 100 kilometers to about 1,000 kilometers up in that range, there are uh, electrons that um, will fluctuate during uh, and sort of indicate uh, seismic, a significant seismic activity. Um, so if we look uh, right here, actually, this is the country of Haiti. If you uh, remember back in 2010, there was a, a very uh, devastating earthquake in Haiti. The epicenter of that was right about there. Um, and so we're looking at uh, electrons that are sort of up in the ionosphere, just around, around this area right here. Um, so that's what, that's what this work is uh, basically in support of. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, well, how, how are you looking at the electrons? What are you just, <laughs> you obviously just can't count them. Um, how does that work? Well, we look at the total electron content. So here um, we have receivers on the ground and satellites orbiting the Earth. And this uh, cross-sectional volume here is our, our atmosphere, specifically our ionosphere, if we're considering the 100 to 1,000 kilometer range. And this satellite is orbiting the Earth and um, making a ray path to these receivers. So when we talk about the total electron content, we're talking about the line integral along this path right here. Um, basically, what what we're hoping, it's, it's using GPS satellites. So signals that are sent and received uh, go back and forth and we get this, this line integral here. And what we want is to extract density from that integral, um, to extract density from the, the TEC. Uh, density will allow us to sort of 
go more in depth with studying the correlation. Joe Hammerstrom has done a lot of work with um, the area, if you guys saw last year when he presented. Um, but if we can arrive at finding a feasible way to sort of look at density, we can study the correlation to a much, a much greater degree um, and hopefully learn more about um, basically the correlation and hopefully predicting earthquakes. Um, so again, here is that line integral I was just talking about. Uh, this, is, this C is our, our total electron content that we're solving for. This is the integral along the ray path. These components right here are simply uh, latitude, longitude, and height. If you think about that, that makes sense because, like we said, we're, we're cutting through the atmosphere and we have, uh, well, it's volume. So um, Now, what happens is uh, we do some fancy math, we get to this summation, but we get an, under, an underdetermined system of equations. Now, what that means is um, we have more unknowns than we have equations to solve for them. If you've ever dealt with those or you know what I'm talking about, it's not a fun place to be. It's actually really frustrating. Um, right here, again, this is TC. This uh, A sub IJ is actually uh, the massive matrix we're talking about, comp composed of the data that we get from uh, the ionosphere. And this is our density. Now, these uh, IJ elements are, we uh, determine those from the choice of the ray path and the basis functions that we use. Um, D, this is our, our density vector, and this N right here is simply error. So we're talking about noise or error in taking the measurements or anything like that, really. Um, and to sort of simplify it a little bit, we just get, all right, our TC is equal to uh, our matrix A times the density. Um, so going forward, um, like I was talking about earlier, this is where the inverting um, the matrix comes in. We, we don't know D. This is our unknown. And like we said, we want to solve for density so we can further understand what we're doing. But we have to invert this matrix to do it. And uh, it's, it, it's massive. In fact, it, it basically doesn't exist for most geometries that we have. Um, Figure two is actually a really good example to sort of, so you can wrap your head around what exactly I'm talking about. So we have our, our receiver down here on the ground and our satellites up here. And it's, simp it's, it's real simple, it's just two, a two cell ionosphere example. So we get our TEC along this path. A1 and A2 are the lengths of the path in this given cell. Okay, so the red right there, that's A1, the blue is A2, and they obviously correlate to the density of this square and the density of this square. Now, we get our TC here is, is simply A1 times D1 plus A2 times D2. It's the length times the density plus the length times the density. But like I said, we're attempting to solve for density. We have two unknowns, so, well, how, where do we go from there? Um, so again, this is, uh, this is here, just solve for D1, nothing changes obviously, but we do have uh, a linear um, equation here. So we know that we can plot that. We're gonna get an infinite amount of solutions um, that does basically nothing for us. Uh, we can pick a point right here, we can pick a point right here, right in the middle. Anything on this line is, is gonna work and satisfy our equation, but it's not gonna really tell us the true density because, well, we just won't know. Um, obviously, if we have a point right here that's 0, uh, 75, and then we have another point over here that's, oh, I don't know, negative 50, 50, we're, th those, can't be, those can't both be correct. We're, we're, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place there. So we go on to uh, what is called singular value decomposition. Now, singular value decomposition is a uh, actually derived from a theorem in linear algebra and involves um, looking at our matrix A and uh, breaking it down to be multiplied by an orthogonal matrix uh, U, um, S, which is a, a diagonal matrix, and the transpose of an orthogonal matrix V. And uh, basically what, what we're looking here at here is, is a, a null space and our actual line. Um, so I want you to think about like, uh, an m by n matrix. If we have a two by four matrix, we only have two possibilities for linear independence. Um, so that's where we get our solutions here. Whereas 
the two that we don't have make up our, our null space. So what we do with singular value decomposition is we take our null space, we get a point on there, and we project it onto our line of actual values. And that's how we get an answer. It's, uh, it's definitely, obviously it's better than this. Just about anything is better than this. But um, it's still not completely ideal. Um, we're using the density that we have as a model, and I, it, we can do better than that, um, especially since it's super expensive, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, maximum entropy is uh, our iterative method that is uh, much more ideal. So to explain this a little bit, these circles coming out are um, each, they're made up of points, and each point has an equal probability of occurring. What we want is we want the point that uh, lies tangent to this line. So when this curve intersects the line for the first time, at just one point, that's what we want. If we get two points and it overlaps it, we've gone too far. If we uh, haven't intersected the line, we haven't gone far enough. This is our iterative method we're going to use. Um, so moving on, the, uh, the real-time dilemma that we sort of come across, well, there's a lot going on in this chart. First of all, let me explain it. So these are our matrices here. Um, simple 10 by 10, uh, we're looking at a uh, number of operations to invert it versus number of operations to invert iteratively. Um, we do n cubed, so we take the biggest uh, number in the matrix, whether it's uh, the rows or the columns, and we cube it. And if uh, for iteratively, we just do n log n, that's all. So these numbers are, as you can see, clearly bigger than these numbers, and get much more bigger as uh, get, get much bigger as we go down to like our real cases. Now, what we want to look at is the computers and, and sort of our processing time. So if we're looking at, uh, you can't really tell with A1, A2, even A5 or A10, they're both, they're both reasonably fast. Um, AR1 right here is our example with one receiver. Um, this 4096 is our latitude, longitude, and height. It's a 16 by 16 by 16 right there. Um, and this 400 is reflective of simply one receiver. So these are our numbers. Uh, this is the number 6.87 times 10 to the 10th, which is pretty big versus 14,000 um, to, to invert iteratively. We're looking at on an average computer, half a minute versus you know one millionth of a second. Um, same, even, even if we're on a, a fast computer, we're still looking at uh, 20 seconds, even maybe even a little more, um, depending on what you've got, what the gigahertz are, um, versus still lightning fast for the other one. The same thing goes with um, the seven receivers. But what I really want you to see is that this is our real case down here. This is what we're actually, this is, these are simple simulations. This is, this is reality. We're dealing with, right here, this number uh, means we have about 400 receivers um, by our uh, dimensions, uh, the latitude, longitude, and, and um, height there. Why did that change? Why did what change? The, the latitude. Oh, it's simply, this, this is a simulation right here. This is the data that we had comprised of. It wasn't a 16 by 16 by 16. It's, it's irrelevant. Um, but what does matter is you take the biggest number in the matrix, and that's what you use. So, we're looking at <laughs> over two days to, to compute this. This is with computers today. This isn't like 10 or 15 years ago. This is now. Uh, almost two days, uh, over two days, to uh, invert it normally versus four ten thousandths of a second to invert it iteratively. If we have a fast computer, we're still talking about over a day, and iteratively is still two ten thousandths of a second. There's really no comparison. Um, so uh, inverting normally is expensive. Inverting iteratively is, is much cheaper because time is money there. So um, I want to give you guys a, a look at the geometries. Um, basically, uh, the data is, this is simply simulated data over our, uh, well, in the ionosphere over Haiti. So right here, this blue plus is the epicenter of our earthquake. Um, these uh, one receiver, three receivers, and seven receivers here, we're going up to one satellite. And you can see that we have a change. If, if you look at it, it's kind of hard to see, but 
and we'll slice it up in a minute on the next slide, but directly over top of our epicenter there's significant activity. Um, and that, let's look at that in a little more detail. So our radial slices are coming out of the board. So if, we, uh, if you look at it like this, this is the ground and this is the sky up here. We're actually out of the atmosphere up here. Um, we're cutting down towards the earth with our, our radial slices. Um, our, our latitude slices are going to be cutting like this and our um, longitude slices are cutting like this. Now, our, uh, the scale for uh, the colors so you guys can sort of grasp that is um, our blue, our light blue is pretty much normal activity um, in, in TEC levels. We're not seeing any significant spikes, we're not seeing anything that's really worth noting, but directly over the, the epicenter um, we're seeing yellow and, and red and dark red here. These are spikes and unusual uh, occurrences with our TEC data. Um, this is, this is the correlation that we're sort of looking at uh, in the simulation that is made up of these. It, it helps to see it. Um, when you look at it like this, it's a little bit too confusing. You can't really grasp it, but when you see that this is how we slice it up, you can kind of tell, okay, well, obviously the epicenter is right around here, um, and you get three different views of it versus one bulky cube there. Um, okay, so uh, this is... Uh, is that simulated data there? Yes. Yes, this right here. Yep. Um, okay. So this is our, like we sort of talked about with the uh, the simpler example. Um, this is our singular singular value decomposition here on the left, and this is our iterative method on the right. We are using one receiver for for this simulation now, and this blue is our simulated actual data. So this is what we want it to look like here. Um, you see that there's spikes, and it's sort of culminates around 3,000 cells or so, and same over here, they're both identical. But when we're looking at the singular value decomposition for simply one receiver, um, we get one spike here that's pretty good, there's a couple gaps. It's starting to get this second one, but we have nothing, we have nothing out here. If we look at, I'm gonna go back like a significant amount so I can show it to you guys. Right here, there's, if we're looking at this, there's, there's nothing a singular value decomposition doesn't account for anything in these cells around here. It's, it, it's only seeing the satellite to the receivers. Um, which is why, if you look on the graphs, you'll see that, well, there's just massive chunks of blue on the left and right that SVD method just can't, it can't do anything about. It does its best with what it can do, and it's right here. Um, iteratively, we're much better. We're starting with something that, a model that we know, and this is with one receiver, but it's still really good. We're looking at, um, it's a little bit out right here, but up into here, um, the red is climbing and it's sort of, uh, s sort of, si well, almost exactly similar, especially right in here, to what the actual data is doing. The same thing goes for um, three receivers. We're seeing more filling in here, but again, <laughs> there's nothing it can do for, for these outer parts. Um, the iterated method is just vastly superior. If we go to seven receivers, we'll start to see a little bit more. Um, we have like two peaks right here, starting to get a third one here, a little bit. It's, it's trying really hard right here, but not really coming up with much. There's still four, five, six um, sort of oscillations on the left and the right that it just can't do anything about. Um, whereas our iterative just starts to improve even more and more. Um, we see more spikes up here. There's red um, coming up there, and uh, it's almost reaching the peak, and that's at a mere seven receivers. So it's, it's much more accurate in terms of uh, the actual data that we want to see. So a couple of things. One is it, it looks like it's picking up zero density when your simulated sort of values don't go to zero. Is that the way to interpret that? What are you saying? The red lines go all the way down to zero. Oh, oh. Yeah, that is the way to interpret that, yeah. So that's a, kind of a major difference or something. What, what are you saying? It's a major difference where? The red lines go all the way down to zero. Yeah. Which is zero density. Oh, well that's just because we don't have receivers there that can account for that. Like, if we're looking, the, the uh, there I can go all the way back I guess. 
if we're looking at this right here, we can't account for anything to the left or the right. We, we don't have a way to. The singular value decomposition will use the receivers that it has access to, cut through the ionosphere, we'll be able to look at that, we'll get absolutely nothing for everything else. I thought that you were saying that that was a cause for it not being across this direction, the horizontal direction. No, I don't think so. No. This, what, what, we're, what we're looking at is, um, now granted it will improve with more receivers, which is why, like if we see in the, uh, uh, the seven receiver case, right here, we're starting to get more because we cover more area. There's, there's, it's able to fill in more holes because we're dealing with seven versus three versus one. Now, obviously, iteratively, we're just that much, it's just that much superior. There's really no comparison. Does that answer your question? Not really, but we can do it afterwards. Okay, all right. Yeah, we can talk about it after. Um, the other thing we talked about um, at the very beginning was the time component, sort of real time. Um, this is just, <laughs> there's no comparison here. So uh, we're looking at an iterative method that is five uh, hundredths of a second versus a couple seconds. This is just for one receiver. Um, three receivers is seven, eight seconds. Still, we're right, on, we're right on par with the iterative method. If we're seven receivers, it's 45, 43 seconds, something like that. Um, and you got to keep in mind, we're dealing with over or around 400 receivers on average. So iteratively, we're still saying, we're still staying be well below one second, but this is just increasing exponentially. So we're saving tons of money and obviously time in doing, um, pursuing an iterative method versus a singular value decomposition method. Um, so I want to, real quick before I go on to the future work, I want to tell you a little bit about the conclusions. So um, there's one thing, well, in, in concluding, obviously, iterative methods are just that much superior. Um, if we're gauging efficiency by both time and, and cost and also accuracy, um, like we see on the graphs, it just models it that much better. There, there really is, this has holes everywhere. Um, it doesn't even account for the majority of the data. Um, and uh, again, time, we're saving time and money. That's also the big thing here. Um, so yeah, as far as future work, there's something that needs to be done that um, right here, we sort of want to look at the uh, margin of error that we have between the iterative method and uh, the actual data. That's something that's kind of important that needs to be done in the future. Um, but granted, uh, it's still that much superior than the SVD, so it's, it's kind of a no-brainer regardless. Um, it would just be good to know. Uh, also, um, future work is sort of, uh, I've done what sort of Joe and Mike have done in the last year and just paving the way for students and for Dr. Cornley in the engineering department to um, have several things happen. First of all, um, I, there are some grants in the work and that sort of thing for research, um, publicity with the department, and also uh, basically allowing other students to continue to build off of what Dr. Cornley has done and what Joe and Mike have done and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, they'll benefit in the, in the coming years. And um, what's also important to remember too that, uh, well, this, this kind of stuff can save lives. And um, it, like we talked about with in, in Haiti in the beginning of the, uh, the slides, it's, it's really, it can save lives. It can save thousands, millions, millions and millions of dollars. Um, and it can, you know, basically alleviate poverty, a type of poverty that's only caused by earthquakes. And that's, that's incredibly invaluable. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to thank Dr. Cornley um, for all the assistance he's given me in, in doing this research. Dr. Free uh, for being the chair and serving for so long. And uh, Joe and Mike for uh, obviously the work you guys have done. Thank you, Joe. Um, and yeah, what are your questions? Yes, uh, Misla. Oh, so the uh, a transform method you're talking about. Um, let's go to it. Mm, almost there we go. Um, 
The geometry that we're dealing with will not lend itself to a, a transform method. We have to use a finite series expansion that's basically independent of geometry. Ionospheric, uh, the ionospheric problem just, it, it doesn't have a geometry that lends itself to it, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Transform methods are very good. If you have data all around, if you have data in plays all around, except for the tomography, then you can use for your transform expansion. Yeah. More questions? <coughs> clock's on up. Clock's on. More questions for the speaker? Because they're getting a lot easy. <laughs> well, I didn't get throwing in the uh, maximum entropy there at the third sort of thing. Oh, uh, where is it? Oh, right here? Yeah. Well, that's an iterative method, just to sort of as a comparison against the SVD. Uh, granted, it's a very simple, simple case because we're dealing with, you know, <laughs> the two-cell ionospheric problem, which is right here. Um, but are, we, are you using physical entropy in feeding that into the model some way or something, or does this mean uh, a method that you're using that's sort of... This is, an, this is an, a type of iterative method. So, and that's, that's what we're exploring here. So iteratively is, is obviously best compared to our SVD. Yeah, I think we're, we're feeding into, yeah, if I'm understanding your question correctly. The question he's asking is, where is the maximum entropy here? So these curves are curves of entropy. Yeah. Each one of these, so along these points, the entropy, all, one curve represents a level of entropy. The next level. With equal probability of each point occurring, which is why. So the algorithm have to jump in space and solution speak back and forth to see which one of these curves satisfies these equations. Where do where is the, that entropy plot come from? You make it up, you come up with Yeah. You're it's uh, so yeah, you're going off of what you know already. Basically. So you have to assume the probability of the Yeah. No more questions? All right.